Yeah, thank you for joining. Um, so our first question will be, um, could you very briefly uh, describe what PSMA is and uh, what its clinical utility is? Sure, PSMA stands for prostate specific membrane antigen and it is a uh, protein that sits on the prostate cancer cell. It's also a normal prostate uh, tissue as well. And it's also expressed on the neovasculature of uh, nearly every solid tumor. The main advantage of uh, PSMA is that it's minimally expressed in normal tissue. Uh, so expression is generally restricted to some isolated normal tissues like Kupfer cells, the proximal renal tubules, salivary glands, specific portions of the gut. But otherwise, it really isn't present in normal tissue. And it provides an ideal target really across all the clinical states of prostate cancer from early disease through the most advanced and heavily pretreated disease. And it's generally expressed across sites of disease as well. So it's in the primary, it's in nodal disease, it's in bone metastases, and it's in uh, visceral and soft tissue disease. Okay, great. Um, and could you describe uh, you know, the utility of PSMA uh, in the diagnosis of prostate cancer, um, both in localized yeah, that's really, as well as advanced disease? It's really one of the emerging and potentially transformative uh, areas of diagnostics in prostate cancer. So it's the basis of a, a PET imaging that really is the first opportunity that we've had to directly image um, prostate cancer, in particular extraglandular disease, very early in the disease course and or very early in relative to uh, relapse from where we used to be able to image. Remember that standard anatomic imaging is dependent on size. So a lymph node is designated as suspicious when it's one and a half centimeters in its longest dimension. Visceral disease equally has, you know, resist criteria for documenting a suspicious visceral metastasis at one centimeter. And bone disease, you have to wait for uh, the, the surrounding bone to transform and in order to see it on a, uh, on a standard bone scan, a relatively insensitive medium for imaging. So all of those really impair the ability to detect disease uh, before, you know, a certain amount of growth and impact on surrounding tissue has been made. Whereas PSMA PET imaging has the ability to image tumor directly and much earlier than you would see it on standard cross-sectional imaging or on, uh, or bone scintigraphy. So you can detect disease both at the point of diagnosis that may have left the prostate itself and make treatment planning much more uh, at, you know, accurately based on the truer distribution of disease. And also for the biochemically relapsed patient, you can detect where their disease is, whether it's local, local regional or distant, much earlier than you could with standard CT MRI or bone scans. Okay, very, very nice. Um, so, you know, this kind of a, goes into my third question for you, but um, in, you know, a standard high risk, uh, you know, prostate cancer patient, let's say, according to NCCN risk uh, uh, groupings, um, do you foresee PSMA PET um, adopting some kind of role in staging these patients? I do, because uh, it allows us to understand where the patient's disease actually is, not where the probability of it being. Right now we use nomograms and predictive models to understand who's likely to have nodal disease and who's likely to have distant disease. But now we can actually see where patients have disease with much greater accuracy than we could. And so we're basing our treatment paradigms or developing those treatment paradigms on a much more accurate representation of their distribution of disease. We, of course, have a long way to go in terms of understanding how do you treat best a patient who otherwise would have been designated just as high risk, but now whom we can actually see that there is disease that previously would just be hypothetically or probabilistically determined, but now we can actually demonstrate disease. So how do we treat the patient who has an isolated bone metastasis that otherwise would have been detected? Or how do we uh, alter a lymph node dissection or radiation portal in reaction to patients 
who have a disease that otherwise wouldn't have been detect detected in the pelvic nodes. But you can't develop those paradigms. You can't test uh, newer ways of treating those patients unless you actually know where the, the, the disease is. And now we do. Right. So I think it will become not just part of clinical trials, but as those clinical trials result, uh, part of standard treatment um, based on pet imaging. Yeah. Okay. Yes, may pet imaging, that is. And, and for a patient, let's say, um, you know, pre-biopsy or they've had a biopsy, um, so they have, uh, you know, there's a, there's a potential to, uh, you know, let's say you, you're, you're wondering if there is any disease and they haven't been diagnosed yet, and you end up getting a multi-parametric MRI of the prostate, um, do you foresee any situations where that patient may also benefit from getting a PSMA PET scan? Sure, but what we don't want to do is develop more imaging modalities to diagnose disease that's clinically irrelevant. We don't need PET imaging to diagnose Gleason 6 disease. Right. We right. need PET imaging to diagnose Gleason 8, 9, and 10 disease, or perhaps 4 plus 3 disease. So I think we have to be careful in the, in the screening population, right? You're talking about pre-biopsy. Mm -hmm. So we need to ensure that PSMA PET can selectively identify those patients who require a biopsy or in lieu of a biopsy, I suppose, ideally, right? You'd be able mm -hmm. to just via PET be able to, to appreciate high-grade disease or clinically significant disease. Um, but what we don't need is a lot of low-risk patients being identified by PSMA where we would otherwise not treat those patients or follow them with active surveillance. So we, we just have to be careful in tr treating PSMA as a screening tool uh, not to fall into the trap of overdiagnosis. Right, okay. You need to selectively diagnose.